Welcome to this gathering, whether you're here in person in the room or uh, watching online. We're so glad you've chosen to worship with us. Well, we're going to sing songs of hope today. I don't know about you, but I need that sometimes. I need that every day, actually. We're going to hear a message of hope. And, you know, sometimes, um, you know, as I'm going through my week, as I'm going through my day, uh, it's so easy for me to lose focus on my source of hope. I place my hope in my circumstances, my my bank account or my, you know, somebody, even somebody that I love. But ultimately, I know those things are going to fail me. Um, so I don't know if you're like me in that way. I'm assuming you are because we're all humans in this room. <laughs> That's kind of the human condition. But we serve a God who is never going to fail. We have a hope in Jesus Christ that will never let us down. And so even if we're not feeling it today, even if we're not even if we're just bringing some anxiety, I know I've, I've felt some anxiety today. I don't know if you're with me there in that. But let's stand together. Let's lift up this song of hope, of joy. And then sometimes we've got to tell ourselves, we've got to sometimes use our voices to tell our bodies, to tell our hearts, to tell our minds that there is hope in Jesus. So let's sing together with great joy as we celebrate. Can we do that? Come on. darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I hold, when brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken, I won't be shaken. Sing it out, come on. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Yes, Lord. Shame no longer has a place to hide. 
stand a chance when I stand in your love mouth. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when It is so good to see all of you tonight. My name is Kay Larson and I'm managing director here at the church. And in a few moments, Pastor Roger is gonna come out and deliver another message in our series, Living Here, Longing for Home. So it is great to see all of you. And if you happen to be watching online, whether you're at the cabin or you're around the world, we wanna welcome you as well. We would ask you, please just leave us a comment and let us know that you're watching. It's just a way that we can connect with you. And if you are new, whether you're watching online or here in this room, we would ask for you to scan that QR code in front of you that says connect. That will take you to a digital connect card and it will help us to better minister to you. Also, if you fill that out, we would encourage you to come to our our table marked I'm new here and you can get a free gift or if you're watching online, we'll send you something in the mail. Your next step in First Connection or in Connection is to attend First Connection. So that happens to be the first Sunday of the month. So that's next week. So if you go to that digital connect card, you can register for that event. And what happens there is that you get to hear a little bit more about God's story. You can hear about our story, our being Berean, and then we get to hear some of your story. And then from there, if you're interested in baptism or membership, you can attend our faith story classes and our foundation classes on the second and third weeks of the month. So as I said, it's so good to see all of you here. And I know it's Memorial Day weekend, so this isn't even all of you. A lot of you are like gone, but it's good to see you. And so what we found out is, you know what? It takes a lot of volunteers to do our weekends and we could use your help. So whether that is working in our parking lot or serving as an usher or a greeter or helping out with Berean kids or even with our tech team, we would love to put you to work. And there's also another opportunity up here that is kind of near and dear to my heart and to a lot of yours as well, and that is the Berean Cafe. Guess what? We're going to be opening back up again. Yes! But we can't do it quite yet because we don't have enough volunteers. So if you have ever wanted to check out that massive espresso machine or want to test your little barista skills, or maybe this is something you have experience in, or you're just gifted in hospitality, please join our cafe team. We would love to have you so that we can get everybody their coffee fix. Now, maybe you're not quite ready for a consistent um, serving experience, and you want just to kind of dip that toe in the water, we have some opportunities there as well. So just because it's summer does not mean that things slow down around here. We have things like the Lakeville Panaprog that's coming up. We are one of the major sponsors for that event. We will have outreach opportunities all week long that you could help out with. We also have Vacation Bible School. And then there is a brand new event that we're gonna have in August. And I'm a little nervous to even mention this since some of our kids literally just finished school this week. But this is brand new, unveiled tonight, Schoolapalooza. Yes. So we are going to help our kids in the neighborhood gear up for school head to toe. Basically anything that your kids might need for school, we wanna try to provide that to kids that don't have that opportunity. So 
More information coming on that in the future, but it's an opportunity for you to serve. And bottom line, we know that when we serve, we have a better opportunity to grow in our faith because we're growing with other people. So please connect with us that way. Lastly, I just wanna wish you a happy Memorial Day. That seems a little weird to say because it's not really something that we would normally wish someone to be happy about, right? This holiday is more about remembrance. It's about thinking about those that gave that ultimate sacrifice for our country. And so we wanna thank you if you had a family member that made that sacrifice because we know you also sacrificed. Some of you may be dealing with loss. Um, this was a tough year. And so many of us lost someone close to us. And what I wanna say to you is you don't have to go it alone. God didn't want us to do it alone. And so Berean has a number of care ministries to help you. Um, you can join one of our support groups. You can get one-on-one -on -one care assistance, whatever the case may be that you need. But we want you to get that help. And so whether you're struggling with the loss of someone that's close to you, the loss of a marriage or something else, there are opportunities for you. And so go to BereanMN.com, go to our care page and learn more. And I wanna thank all of you who have given so consistently and faithfully to the, the Berean Ministries. When you do that, Berean care is possible and other ministries like it. So at this time, I would ask if you would consider investing in partnership with us and doing ministry with us financially. So you can do that through um, giving online, going through the church center app, going through the QR code that's in front of you that will take you to a secure site, or you can give at the buckets at the door as you exit at the end of the night. But I do wanna wish all of you a very safe weekend. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we're gonna continue in worship if you'd please stand as we sing. Yes, Lord, you are our rock, our cornerstone, our solid ground. Here says we cry out to you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's declare it together, come on. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Every voice. My hope is built on nothing less than you, Jesus, than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, our cornerstone. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. Savior's love through the storm. He is the Lord. Yes, He is. seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. Thank you, Lord. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds, my anchor holds within the veil. Declare it. We
come with trumpet sound on that glorious day. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. May we place our hope in no other, but only in you.
Yes, Lord, we declare together that you alone have the power to push back the darkness, to break the chains, to release the captives. You've broken the power of sin and death, and you've given us an incredible hope. May we stop putting our hope and our trust in anything else. You're the only thing that will never fail. We acknowledge that here together right now in this place as we celebrate you. As we hear your word, Lord, would you transform our hearts, even as you've already begun doing that, as we've sung. Your word has power to change, to change hearts. And I pray that that would happen in this place. May your spirit move mightily as your word is opened before us. We love you and give you thanks. We lift you up. Amen. Please be seated. Living here in this place is not always what you thought it would be. You long for peace. You long for hope. You long for more. Do you recognize it? It's a longing for home. Well, hello, Living Church. It's good to see you on this holiday weekend, and uh, wherever you are, it's glad that we're glad that you gathered with us around the Word of God. And we're in the middle of a series called Living Here, Longing for Home. We have one foot in this world and one foot stretched toward the other, but we live here. And the Apostle Peter understood that very well. And he's talking to a church that is living here in great difficulty, but he's pointing out to them all the resources they have in Christ. And so tonight we continue this series, and we're reading this tonight from 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 13. So if you're able to stand in honor of God's word, would you stand as we read these five verses? But who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this word. And we ask now, Holy Spirit, that you will bring the application you want for each one of us to our own hearts. So that we leave here with conviction and action. And Lord, I pray that what is said tonight may even remove obstacles to the true gospel of Jesus. I pray that it will also strengthen believers. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Well, back in the latter part of March, uh, Pastor Tony delivered two messages on this section of scripture. And he was talking about, we were, we were ramping up toward Easter and uh, we're, he talked about the road to hope and he talked about how hope has a name, and the name is Jesus. And when hope is hard, we need to depend on him. And he challenged us to take our story of hope to people who need to hear hope. And so he did two messages on that. I'm sure you remember them quite well. I'm kidding a little bit because I can't remember what I spoke on last week. But anyway... I can't improve on what he said, but what I want to concentrate on tonight in this passage is just verse 15, which is often what we concentrate on anyway in this passage. Here's what it says, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks, ask you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. I want to talk tonight about a defense of your faith. 
The word here is apologia. Apologia is the word for apologetic. It doesn't mean we apologize for being a Christian. What it means is we defend it. And so Christian apologetics is the, the, the science, the art, the discipline of defending the Christian faith from outside the Bible, making it look uh, and appear uh, defensible and logical. And uh, the context we're in here is that, that Peter has been talking about how we live here. And in chapter 2, verse 12, he goes through five different scenarios of how we're to live in this world. He said we're called to be holy, we're a called people, we're a chosen people, we're a a chosen generation, we're a priesthood unto God. We have all these advantages in heaven, but we live here. So how do we live here? And he talked about living in the pagan world, the Gentile world, he called it. He talks about living under governments. How should we live under governments that are not holy governments? How should we, as slaves, treat our masters and vice versa? How should a wife live with her husband and a husband with her wife? And how should the living body of Christ maintain unity in the body of Christ? And in all those cases, what he said is, I want you to be subject. I want you to be humble. I want you to take your strength and I want you to place it under the need and I want you to demonstrate that you are honorable people in the eyes of those who watch. He's done all of that in these, in these verses, and he said, you don't have to worry, he says in verse 13, now, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for good? Well, this is either a, a, a really a sarcastic line or a cruel joke, but I don't think it's either one of those. I think what Peter is saying is, you need to look to your ultimate hope, your ultimate hope, which is beyond this world, that you have nothing to worry about when you know who is on your side, like in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall, they say, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Peter is calling us to an ultimate end time hope, not just momentary hope, but hope beyond the struggle that we're going. And he says, don't have fear. Don't have fear of them. Don't be troubled by what is happening, happening to you. But honor the Lord, the Lord, the, the Messiah, as the ultimate fulfillment of everything that God has promised. Because he said, you will get resistance. You will get pushback. After all, this whole book is about a church that is suffering and struggling under persecution. And it's not official Roman persecution. It's persecution from the culture. And boy, are we starting to feel that here in this culture. But what Peter is now saying in chapter 3, verse 15 is this. Your personal subjection to rulers or masters or your subjection to your husband or your wife, your your humility before them under all these various conditions and, and authorities with gentleness and respect does not imply passivity or capitulation of the truth of the scripture and the gospel. Because after all, Christianity stands on the truth. It stands on the fact of Jesus. It stands on revelation. So we can confidently stand. We can confidently defend. We can confidently make our face, our case in the face of every onslaught, every government, every resistance. So my focus in this message is how to make that defense, at least to start that defense. And whether you're in junior high or you're a Ph.D., You know, whether you're a brand new Christian, a skeptic, or a seminary professor, we're going to talk about some ways that you can take with you to defend the faith that you have. And we've never needed it more than now. We're feeling resistance, aren't we? We're feeling the disdain of the culture that would say, you have the effrontery to say that you know the one way? You bigots, you are dangerous. We are so misrepresented in our culture. Never have there been more frontal attacks on campuses and in the media against Christianity. When you think about what we call the new atheists, uh, guys by the name of Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. And there's also never been more danger from within the church with critical theory or the social gospel or the progressive church coming inside and redefining the mission of the church and the message of Jesus. 
We've never been more exposed to ridicule and the possibility of being canceled by, by the media and the social media culture. So there's shifting sand within the church, within the evangelical church, and there are arrows from outside the church. So there's never been a more needy time to be able to stand and defend. So I have two audiences in mind as I speak this message. One is believers, believers who have questions. Do you ever have questions and doubts? Do you ever wonder, really? Is this all true? I I want it to be true. I I believe it's true, but do you ever have doubts? Well, of course you do. I have them. Sometimes we get shaky and we need to be reassured and fortified what we stand on. So that's one audience. The second audience is the skeptic, the person who's unconvinced, the person who's an unbeliever. And for both of those audiences, the believer and the skeptic, we need more than the Scripture. Now, let me say that very carefully. We believe in the Bible. We believe the Scripture is true. It is the inspired Word of God. We believe it will prove itself true. But you're not being questioned about verses. You're not being questioned about your theology at work or at school. You're being questioned about your rationality. You're being questioned about your motive. You're being questioned about your logic and your very sanity. And for the the skeptic, you, this appeal to the authority of the Scripture just goes right over your head. It's, It's like water off a duck's back. And if we say it louder, that doesn't make it more true for you. If we appeal to this authority and you don't accept this authority, then we're just making noise. You need something more than Scripture to compel you to listen to this because we're not answering the core questions about veracity and truth in your mind. Well, this is what apologetics does. Apologetics is not evangelism per se. It's not proving who God is. It's simply trying to remove rational mental obstacles so that what we're saying through Scripture has more clarity to you. As one great apologist once said, the heart cannot rejoice in what the mind rejects as false. So apologetics tries to do that. So today, I want to take off from this text, not develop the whole passage here. I want to take off from this text, and I want to show the believer four things that you already believe about God, but now they're going to be confirmed by reason as well. And for the skeptic, I want to show you four things you already believe by reason, but that are only confirmed in Scripture. And guess what? It's the same four things for both audiences. So I want to bolster the confidence of the believer And I want to challenge with with gentleness and respect the skeptic. Whether you're in junior high or you're a PhD, no matter where you are. And this is done in the spirit of the most famous apologetic message in the scripture, which is Acts 17, where the apostle Paul went up by the the Parthenon and he he went there and spoke on Mars Hill. And uh, he spoke in Acts 17, and he said, I want to I share with you what you already believe, this, this, this altar you've made to the unknown God, and now I want to explain it to you. I want to make it known to you. So I want to give you four things that both skeptics and believers already believe. And the first thing is this. There must be a cause. There must be a cause. Where did that come from? It wasn't here a minute ago. This had to have a cause. Someone behind the curtain threw it, maybe? This is the question of all earthly phenomena. Not only what is, but where did it come from? What's its origin? This is irrefutable and innate logic. We've got to know What caused this? You walk in the house, it smells wonderful. The cause is mom's making cookies. 
you're, there's a chip on your windshield and it shatters while you're driving down the highway, you look for the dump truck that's missing a mud flap. It's 38 degrees on May 30th in Minnesota. <laughs> you look on the weather map for a Canadian weather front that went through. There's got to be a cause for everything. <laughs> we'll play a little soccer here. There's got to be a cause for the things that we see, for all the phenomena of the world. The roof is torn off, you look for a tornado. Your thumb is throbbing, you look for the hammer in your other hand. There's always a cause. And this assumption burns hot and bright in every human mind. What is the origin? Where did it start? Where did the original elements and the original energy come from? Can you name anything that doesn't have a cause? Oh, you think that proves God? No, I don't think that proves God. But then people say, well, what about the Big Bang? Or what about 15 billion years of evolution? Well, that's just shrouding and hiding behind pallets of books and rosters of impressive, impressive degrees and, and the abyss of time and, and mountains of raw data, but it isn't answering the core question. What was there at the cause? Because whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, there's nothing that is causeless. Francis Collins, who was the the chairman of the committee, the group that, uh, that unlocked the human genome. And uh, he became a believer during that time as he looked at the DNA of humanity. I, I can't, can't vouch for all of his theology, but listen to what he said. Quote, the universe began with an unimaginably bright flash of energy for, from an infinitesimally small point. Before that, there was nothing. I can't imagine how nature could have created itself. It had to be outside nature. Well, some speculate, well, a UFO brought some kind of living matter to the, to the world. Extraterrestrials deposited it. 15 billion years of evolution. And it's one thing to assume time and matter and chance can produce certain things but it is a nonsensical leap of illogic to believe that something came from nothing, that matter is eternal, that there's an uncaused cause, that nothing preceded it. Now, this is no slam dunk proof that God exists, but it is an inescapable dilemma. Where did it all come from? Because nothing cannot produce something. So what do you believe? You believe there must be a cause. And for the believer, it's answered in the first 10 verses of the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's confidence for the, for the believer. It's a challenge for the skeptic. There's a, a second thing. I need my, I need my prop here. <laughs> Sorry to the cameraman there. There's a second thing that we all believe, both the, the believer and the Christian believe, and the, the skeptic believes, and that is order. Where will this go? When I let go of it. Oh, it went down. Oh, let's try it again. 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 We live in a world that is a world of order. There are things that are predictable. Gravity is predictable. If the world resulted from random chance, how could it be that we can predict a comet coming back in 300 years with absolute clarity. Planes take off regularly and land because they can predict what's going on. 
not the weather in Minnesota, but every place else they can. So what if the pilot came on and said, folks, our flight is delayed because there's new evolution going on in Atlanta right now, and, and we're waiting for some, some new favorable evolution of, of our, of our uh, atomic level of air so we can land there again, but right now it's changing. We live in a world of order. We expect order. We see order. We depend on order. And both the believer and the skeptic believes there must be order in the world. We look at the periodic table and we can predict chemical reactions. One molecule of hydrogen and two of oxygen always makes water. Gravity is predictable. Lunar and solar eclipses are predictable 2,000 years from now. Water boils at 212 degrees at sea level every time. Potholes will appear in the springtime in Minnesota. (laughs) Scientists say there are 15 constants with precise values. And if you're off by one one millionth, matter ceases to exist. Carl Sagan, who some say came to faith late in his life, but nevertheless made a, a, a... a video a television series called The Cosmos and, and basically indoctrinated a whole generation of Americans about where it came from and what it means. And in that series, he said this, quote, to continue to survive an earth-like world must also continue to be lucky. The role of something close to random chance in all of this is striking. But in light of modern understanding, there is no sign of divine guidance here, or at least nothing beyond physics and chemistry. The continued operation of mindless selection process can convert chaos into order. That is his unobserved and unfounded and illogical leap into the dark. It doesn't answer a thing about where this order came from. He just layers on big words and all kinds of data, but it's really just a word sausage of discarded bits that you wouldn't use for anything else. You would never eat them by themselves. It's just logical alchemy, but people sit and listen to that because it's coming from a brilliant person, but it's dishonest and it's denying That order doesn't come out of disorder. It'd be like having a tanker truck full of alphabet soup. And you drive it around, you just slosh it all together, and then you dump it out, and it magically comes up with the IRS tax code. (laughs) Which actually probably isn't too far from the truth. But what we're talking about here is order and design. Think about the human eye. They say there are two million working parts in the human eye. The lens, the retina, the tear ducts, the muscles. This is design. And it's irreducibly complex. Because if one part doesn't work, nothing works. This is design. We see it all over the place. Think of your cell phone. Don't take it out unless you're reading the Bible, okay? When you see a cell phone, you look for a designer. When you see water or plankton or birds or DNA, or you see all of the stars in the sky, when you see physics and logic and medicine and science, it all has order. Where did the order come from? Order doesn't come from randomness. Here's somebody's name I can't pronounce, but she's a double Nobel Prize winner in, or he, in chemistry. It says, the statistical probability that organic structures and the most precisely harmonized reactions that typify living organisms would be generated by accident is zero. That comes from somebody a lot smarter than me. Order. We must have Order. It's interesting, isn't it, that those who so so strongly believe in order, many who are scientists, they believe in the laws of physics and 
and science. And they deny the existence of God because they don't believe in miracles. So committed to order, which God made, that they can't see that God is also free to intercede and do miracles. So what did the Apostle Paul say about this order? He said in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. It's a cause of worship and awe in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. And then it gets very personal in scripture because in Colossians chapter 1, it says there's a, there's a personal author and agent of all of this. For by him, that is Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. There's a coherence that is not only theological, it is physical, it's astronomical, it's galactic. And because you already believe there is order, my question is, where does that come from? To the believer, what great assurance it is to know that we live in a world of order because it has the hand of God and his fingerprint on it. To the skeptic, I would just ask you, where does this order come from? You use it every day. Even the things you can't explain, you try to explain by the things that are ordered. Even when we see some random molecule or some random particle in, in, an, in an atom, we try to explain that unexplainable by the things that, that are ordered. So order is undeniable. It's an empirical fact. Why do you believe in it? Well, there's a third thing that we believe, and that is we believe in purpose. The Christian and the skeptic both believe that there is purpose in the world. You know what this is, this funny-looking thing? It obviously had a designer, but, but what's it for? You know, is it, is it a, you know, a, a bookend or what is it? Well, it's, it's a wood clamp. And it's interesting because it's, it's a wood clamp that has great use that, in the shop. And, and it's, it, if you know what it's for then you know how to use it. It's, you can put great pressure. You use this screw on this end and this fulcrum here, and you can put great pressure right here. Does anybody want to bring your earlobe up here? <laughs> we'll, we'll demonstrate that. But when you use it in its right place, it's exactly what is needed. It's designed for a purpose. So let's take a big leap. What is your purpose? What is the purpose of a human life. Why am I here? Am I here for happiness or love or pleasure or family? Am I here to do good? Does it matter? Am I here to work? Am I here to provide? What about all the pain and the despair in life? This is a challenge for the skeptic. What is the purpose of my life? If there's no author, if there's no designer, if, those, there's no, if there's no cause, if there's no order, what is my purpose? If all of life is random, then there's no ultimate meaning to our life. There's a song that captures two centuries of the despair of existentialism. It happens to be sung by Steve Martin, who can sing it like no other. It's a song called Atheists Don't Have No Songs. He claims that it's the entire hymn book of atheism. Here's how it goes. Christians have their hymns and pages, Hava Nagilas for the Jews. Baptists have their rock of ages. Atheists just sing the blues. 
Romantics play Claire de Lune, born again, sing He is Risen, but no one ever wrote a tune for godless existentialism. <laughs> he, he makes us smile, but it's a gallows humor. Because if there is no purpose, there is nothing to sing about. But nobody here is living without purpose. You get up, you go to work, you go to school, you have desire, you have goals. And it requires deep personal honesty to ask the question, what is my purpose? Beyond today, beyond this week, beyond the next decade, what's the ultimate purpose of my life? And without that purpose, life is unlivable. There's a story about an astronaut who landed on a a planet, a lonely planet, no, nothing was there. It was habitable, but it was com- he was completely alone, and he knew he would never be found. And so he began to despair, and he looked in his survival kit, and he found two vials. And one vial said immortality, and the other one said poison. And after he thought about living on this planet alone, never being able to see another purpose, person for, for the rest of his life, he took the poison and drank it to take his life but then he didn't die and he realized that the labels had been switched and now he's stuck in immortality with no purpose I mean can we imagine being stuck in Disney World in the dark alone forever For no purpose, nothing there, nothing to do. If there's no purpose in life, life becomes unlivable. There are no answers, there's no direction, there's really no morals. It's not no different whether I work or I steal. It doesn't matter if I love or I hate, or I hate ultimately. It doesn't matter if I murder or rescue. The only path really is to follow my impulse and do what I feel like doing. Morality is a myth and justice is just an invention. Now nobody or very few live that way because we must have a purpose and I'm not claiming that you don't have a purpose. I'm claiming you probably have a lot of purposes but if you don't believe in a God who created you, if you don't believe there's order, if you don't believe there's a, a godly purpose for your life, then you've borrowed a purpose from somewhere else. You've smuggled it in to make life seem meaningful. You believe it to be true, but it has no foundation. There's a lot beneath the waterline in the striving of people. And we hear it all the time, and it is documented in the book of Ecclesiastes that it ends up being vanity of vanities, chasing after the wind. Because a life without purpose is a desperate life. And this may be your crisis of faith. To ask yourself the question, if I have a creator and he has order in the world, and if he's calling me to himself, do I really want to give up my independence and surrender my will to him? Is this a matter of my own willfulness? Do you believe you have purpose? Both the believer and the skeptic live with purpose. The question is, is there a foundation under that purpose? Well, there's a fourth thing that we all believe. Both believers and non-believers. We believe that we're part of a larger story. We don't believe that history is just cyclical. We believe there's a, a linear cast to history, that we're, we're going somewhere. And if you're already a believer, you believe you're part of a larger story, that God is working this out somehow. It's not sheer randomness. But we all want to know, well, where did I fit? What what was my contribution? What did I bring to the world that I can offer to the world? And the most common objection to the way the world is running right now is the the issue of, of suffering and pain and judgment and guilt. And the objection is, 
You know, what about all the things that are wrong in the world? How do we explain all of that? What's the larger story? Is it just a mass of of endless chaos? Well, the scripture has a basic template that doesn't answer every single detail, but it gives us a way to walk through what's happening in our world. And it's basically three things. Number one, we believe in creation. There is a cause, there is order. But secondly, we believe it's a moral universe and that there's what we call the fall, that sin entered, rebellion against God. Adam and Eve stiff-armed God and went their own way, and that sin caused the disruption in the moral universe that's also affected the physical universe until everything is fallen. So there's creation and there's fall, and we live under the conditions of that. But then thirdly, there's redemption. God is in the process of redeeming this fallen world. Ultimately, one day, with ultimate hope, when Christ comes again, it will all be wrapped up and brought to redound to his glory. But right now, we live here. We long for home. But there is an explanation for why things happen. Not every minute detail, but the fact that we live in a fallen planet with sinful human beings, including myself, is the reason that it explains the culture, the history that we're all walking through. That there's, but there's redemption of all of this, and Jesus came to prove that. Now, you may not believe that right now. You may not understand all of how that happens, but you do believe that there's a story being told here, and if it's going to make any sense at all, you're going to have to find a cause and order and purpose and ultimately, where you fit in that story. Robert Jastrow is a very famous astronomer, a, Christ, a Christian, and he, he said this, this, this incident. He said, for, for the scientist who has lived, his, lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends in a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak, And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. That's not to be smug. That's to be hopeful. That's to be invitational. We will all end up the same place on our own power, wondering, what is the answer to all of these things? Where did the first cause come from? Why is the world ordered and and has design? What is my purpose in life and where do I fit in the story? I would maintain the only answer is found here. In the living God, through the living word, through the living Holy Spirit who says, I will give you life. And a biblical worldview is not just some kind of, of, of academic exercise. It's just not some kind of athletic enterprise It means life. I understand my life. And God gives me this life as he redeems my life. So you don't have to believe in a biblical worldview. But you believe deeply in some things that I don't think can ever be answered without knowing who God is. So my invitation to you, if you're listening to this and you're a skeptic, Maybe you've been to church for years. It's just never quite been true. That this is a reasonable faith. It is backed up by rationality and logic, but it's only made powerful by the gospel that becomes personal. We can never argue you into the kingdom. We can never prove God. He needs to make himself known to you. But the Spirit of God will draw you to himself. And he will show you, if you will open your eyes, how the truth is true at all levels. And Jesus fulfills your deepest longings. And when that happens, everything coheres. There's cause and order and purpose and story and a foundation under all of it. It's interesting at the end of Acts 17, when Paul preached his famous sermon, That it said many of them mocked him and walked away, but some believed. They met Jesus that day, and their life was changed. 
Reason can only prepare your heart. But it can also challenge you. And for the believer, if you have questions that have not been answered, Jesus always welcomed real questions. Christianity, evangelicalism is not afraid of the questions. If you have doubts that need to go beyond some Bible verses to get answers, God has given the world brilliant people to help us reason, take away some objections so that the heart can be free to follow Jesus. I hope this message encourages both sides of that aisle, both the believer and the skeptic, to come to hear, to reason together. Let's pray about how God will apply this to your life. Will you pray with me? Our Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity. And I pray for someone listening on the internet. I pray for those here in this room that, Lord, if there are questions that need answers that we will be unafraid to ask, and then, Lord, would you provide the answer. There are so many mysteries still, but Lord, we need to anchor ourselves in these core beliefs. And so I pray that you will make it plain, that you'll open up hearts and minds, that you might bring someone a step closer to receiving the grace and love of Jesus tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I do want to invite you, if God is stirring in your heart, if you have questions about who he is and who you are, that, that you will ask, that you will come. That you'll jot me an email or go to that Connect tab on our website and, and ask for prayer or a, an appointment with someone to talk about what is essential for your understanding and your very life. That's exactly what we'd love to do. I believe God is moving, that God is calling you, to a deeper level of faith if you know him already I believe he's calling you to himself if you've never crossed that threshold I believe he's calling you I pray you'll respond God bless you let's stand as we respond together you unravel me with the melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave child of God From my mother's womb You have chosen me Love has called my name I've been born again to your family oh, Your blood flows through
Yes, Lord, we are your children. We are your people. As we leave this place, let the hope that we found in you be evident in the way we walk, in the way we talk, in the way we smile at, our, at the people we pass. May our words be used for love and kindness so that people can know the kindness you've showed us. We love you. We lift you up. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you together with our brothers and sisters. May the worship continue throughout our lives until we come back here again in this place next week. We love you. We lift you up. You are worthy alone. Amen. Amen. Thanks for worshiping here in this place. And thank you for joining us online. For those of you that did, if you're here and you need prayer, there will be people praying with you down front if you want to come down. If you're giving, uh, there will be opportunities at the door. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you back here next week.